Hey, I'm Dan. Hi. We're meeting Sam. tomorrow at 9, I think. Yes. Good. Excellent. See ya. <laughs> yes. Pretty good. Name me, remind me. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. With Eileen. Nice to see you again. Yeah. Are you in Anthro here? No, I'm in EB. Yeah. With Dan. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I have. Uh, hey, how's it going? Maybe it's doing your schedule. Yeah. I'm going to miss your other talk. Well, I don't know what that schedule is so far. Okay. Which is fine. You're not missing because, anything. Yeah, yeah. I'm fine. <laughs> it was very nice of him to arrange that for me because it can be a little bit nightmarish to get a schedule done.
it's a Good, good to see you too. I saw your name and I was like, it sounds familiar. I Googled it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Are you, so you working on the No, I'm, I'm working on um, virus evolution. Oh, okay. Now, and still with a social sort of focus. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll mention it a little bit at the end. Cool. I'm going to talk tomorrow about it if you're interested. Um, in, uh, it's in the Life Sciences building. Oh, okay. In is it EB. Oh, okay. Yeah. I haven't Jamie Lloyd Smith is going to... Yeah. I think it's, yeah, no, I think it's, it's, it was uh, announced amongst the Ecology of Evolution and Infectious Disease people. Okay. I think that was the, the idea. Gotcha. Um, in which case it would be unfortunate. Uh, but, but, uh, but yeah. Yeah, how have you been? Good, good. I'm finishing up the summer. So oh, great. In the mad dash oh. to find a job. Yeah. But uh, other than that, no complaints. A specific job? Or? No postdoc? A job. Postdoc. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Yeah. I ended up working on damselflies. So oh, great. Yeah. Anyways. Okay. Awesome. <clears throat> good afternoon. And welcome to this week's talk in the Major Revolution Public Speaker Series. We meet every Monday about the academic year, every Monday with classroom sessions after the time in this room. And to find a list of talks, you can just Google UCLA BEC. Our website will be at the top of the list. And from there, you can navigate to the page that lists upcoming talks. And every talk circulate a sign-in sheet. You can ask you to sign that so that we can demonstrate the three decision makers. Which is Kelly Gildersleeve, and the title of her talk will be Meta-Analytic and Experimental Investigations of Shifts in Women's Mate Preferences and Attractiveness Across the Ovulatory Cycle. And the following Monday, that's May 19th, we'll hear from our own Stacy Rosenbaum. The title of her talk will be The Development of Male Social Partner Preference in Maturing Mountain Gorillas. Sure. I just realized I have an announcement. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Um, uh, so uh, Colin Holbrook, who is a postdoctoral fellow with Tech, has won the Chancellor's Award for um, Postdoctoral Research. Um, you, may, you may recall that um, someone with a very similar name, namely Jennifer Hahn Holbrook, won the Chancellor's Award for Postdoctoral Research last year. She was also a, <laughs> <laughs> was also a, a, a back postdoc, so we're, we're two for two. Nice. Right. So today we're, we're pleased to welcome Sam Diaz Munoz of UC Berkeley, and the title of his talk is Tiny Cameron's Challenge Traditional Perspectives on Sex Roles, Mating Systems, and the Evolution of Cooperation. Uh, thank you.
thank you. Thank you for having me here um, and for inviting me. It's an honor to be here and speak to you. Um, I wanted to do a more traditional format uh, with the talk. And if you can please hold your questions for the end, because you have this nice discussion period at the end. And hopefully, we can talk about it um, at the end. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit today about my doctoral work um, and, and, and some subsequent work that I've done since on, on tamarind uh, behavior and some of the broader themes that, um, that have emerged from that research. So I've been fascinated with uh, evolution ever since I learned about it. And the Darwinian conception of evolution has two uh, really revolutionary uh, concepts. One is uh, common descent um, of all living things. And the other one is evolution by natural selection. And these two concepts together not only explain the biodiversity of life, but have also been of immense practical significance uh, to us as, as, as humans um, as tools to uh, uh, use for agriculture and for the spread of infectious disease um, and for our human health. Um, however, there are two big problems with uh, evolution at its conception. Um, one was cooperation. Um, so I wanted to use, and the other one was sex. Um, so let me take these in turn. Um, I wanted to explain the problem of cooperation with these honeypot ants. So those things sticking from the ceiling are actually ants. Um, they're sterile workers that serve sort of as living refrigerators of, nectars that, of nectar. That's why their abdomens are engorged like that. And they will feed the other workers of the colony and ultimately the queen, who is the only one who's going to reproduce here. Now, if evolution is all about passing your genes to the next generation, how do you get something like this to evolve? Um, this should be quickly selected against. Um, and this is something that troubled Darwin deeply. And, and he even said that initially, at least, it seemed like an insuperable difficulty that would be fatal to his whole theory. <clears throat> the second problem was sex. And more specifically, it was sexual behavior and the traits associated with uh, sexual behavior. There were just some traits that didn't seem like they would improve fitness um, in terms of survival. Um, such as some antlers and some cervids, um, and uh, long tails in birds such as this widow bird, where it seems like it doesn't not only does it not help survival, but it might actually um, negatively impact survival. So again, how do you explain that um, through natural selection? Well, Darwin went ahead and wrote a whole other book about this um, and used sexual selection, um, which we sort of now view as a, as a subset of natural selection, um, to explain secondary sexual characters. And today, these are some of the most active areas in evolutionary biology. So the evolution of cooperation literature and the sexual selection literature are vast and have been very productive. Um, and I wanted to tread lightly a little bit on the cultural aspect. I wanted to bring a cultural aspect to the, to the talk. Um, and it's, it's not my training, but I think it's relatively uncontroversial to say that the social environment we, lived in, we live in uh, influences our perceptions of problems as scientists. Um, and, and I think it also influenced uh, Darwin's worldview um, in, in some ways. So the struggle for existence and competition is central through to uh, natural selection, right? And, and as many of you might know, um, this idea uh, came from, from the writings of Malthus, and Darwin was inspired by this. Um, and we had a talk um, at Berkeley by James Moore, who, is, uh, who was talking about his forthcoming book. He's a Darwin scholar. And so he studied sort of the social environment that Darwin lived in. And he argues that Darwin wasn't just inspired by Malthus. Malthus he was actually in his social circle. So, Darwin was uh, married, uh, had several uncles by marriage um, that were um, faculty with Malthus at the East India College. Um, and the East India College in Victorian uh, England was really the cradle of free market and capitalist thought. Um, so, <clears throat> so Darwin was really immersed in, in, in a culture that valued these I ideas um, and emphasized these ideas. Um, but not everyone necessarily shared those ideas at that time. And as Jane Moore uh, argues in the book, Alfred Russell Wallace, which is the co-author of the theory of, of evolution um, with Darwin, did not share those ideas. 
nor did Peter Kropotkin, who was a contemporary of Darwin and admirer of Darwin, but he thought basically, as he wrote in his book Mutual Aid, that cooperation was everywhere in nature, right? Um, so in regard to how the Victorians perceived sexual behavior, I don't have to say much, but I couldn't resist this quote, which is actually from uh, Victorian uh, Canada and leisure activities that women would uh, do. And, and basically, the medical community expressed a fear that the women riding bikes would have organ, uh, orgasms and then uh, create a nation of oversexed females. So I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Um, so I, I think perhaps the perception of these two issues as problems had something to do with the cultural context um, that, that was in there. And, and I think, in a way, the, over time, the data has a way of, of shining through. And today, we understand the importance of cooperation um, and, and more specifically, the balance between conflict and co cooperation in mediating major transitions in life and so that you know, cells become together to form multicellular organisms um, and organisms come together uh, to form social groups and, and social groups you know, become uh, societies that are based on symbolic communication. Um, and similarly, uh, we now appreciate the diversity of sexual behavior in nature and I really want to highlight these comics uh, by the Danish artist, artist Human. So they are anthropomorphic, but I think that because of that, they serve as great teaching tools um, about the diversity of mating arrangements and social structures um, in nature. I really encourage you to, to look these up. They're really, really great. And they're well-researched. They're based on really, really current research. Um, So, so I think um, that we are gaining an awareness that these fields have, have, have largely, and by these fields I mean the evolution of cooperation and the evolution of sexual selection, have sort of uh, proceeded pretty parallel to each other. And I think we're gaining awareness that we can interface both of these fields and understand more about animal behavior. And I, uh, I, I came to this realization by my studies with tamarins. And tamarins, just to introduce the study species a little bit, are um, New World primates. They live in groups of three to nine individuals. Um, and uh, marmosets, um, which are also part of the calatricans, which is a subfamily of, of primates. I'll be talking about them a little bit, too. They have bigger groups of about 15 individuals. And they are tiny, as I mentioned in the title of my talk. This is a baby tamarin, uh, but, but the uh, pygmy marmoset can be that size um, at uh, adulthood. Um, and and calatricans are really exceptional for their social behavior. So they are extremely cooperative, and cooperation pervades really every aspect of their society. They share food, they cooperatively forage, um, and it is really central to their reproduction. And so. Among primates, they're arguably the only sort of full-fledged cooperatively breeders, cooperative breeders uh, among primates. Um, and, and for all practical purposes in nature, they're obligate cooperative breeders. Um, so, so I think they, they really highlight the importance of the interaction of, of, of uh, actually, let me just read this quote, which I think encapsulates what I'm trying to say, which is by Nick Davies, uh, where he studied the Dunnox, and he said, that they have a variable mating system which reflects the various individual conflicts of interest within a breeding population. Um, and so I'm going to be uh, talking to you about the, the tamarin mating system a lot through this lens and pointing out places where I think it applies to other species. OK, so a little outline I'm going to talk to you today about uh, in three parts, cooperative male parental care in Jeffrey's Tamarin. Um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, reproductive, female reproductive competition in, uh, in a series of uh, t uh, Saguinus tamarin species, and about mating systems and, and how uh, cooperation and competition among individuals, I think, really sheds some light on, on, a, on, a, on our conception and our definition of mating systems. So when we think about uh, the 
quote, conventional roles uh, that males have um, uh, in terms of sexual behavior. And if we filter it through the lens of this deer, uh, the expectation is that this deer will be hyper competitive with other males, um, mate with as many females as it can, and, and, uh, and provide uh, no parental care, basically. Um, and this is because we view almost invariably males as reproductive competitors, especially when it comes to matters of sex. Um, and, and this is perhaps why uh, polyandry is a rare mating system. And by polyandry, I mean when a female mates with more than one male. Um, <clears throat> and male parental care is also at odds with this expectation of, 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 of males maximizing their fitness at all costs. Yet in nature, we have some examples of uh, pretty elaborate male cooperation. Males cooperate even when it comes to sex. Um, so these lance-tailed mannequins will engage in elaborate cartwheel displays to attract females. It's a highly coordinated display. And wild turkeys um, will do the same, uh, a similar display to attract females. And in both of these cases, they're actually more successful than solo males at attracting females. And many of you might be familiar with the example of lions, which form coalitions to oust other males and mate with the females of the pride. And we have uh, a recent paper out with my uh, doctoral advisor, Eileen Lacey, and a few of the lab members. We all ended up studying similar questions of male cooperation. And we're really trying to document uh, this phenomenon in, in nature. Um, so, so the point is that males cooperate even when it comes to sex. So I was interested in these questions. And I decided to study uh, uh, Jeffrey's tamarind, um, which is shown here in this uh, um, beautiful engraving by, by Henry Forbes. Um, and this is what it looks like. Um, and I will be most of the time talking about my field research um, on Jeffrey's tamarind, um, which I conducted in Panama. But I'll add some uh, data on other saguana species. And I had the privilege of working in Panama in this beautiful rainforest. Um, with, which is a great place to work with, work at if you like biodiversity. These are pictures by Anand Varma. Um, and this is, this is how the mating system roughly works. Um, so you have a breeding female, um, which mates with two or more males, and then they produce fraternal twins. Um, so in humans' depiction, it looks something like this. So about 80% of births are fraternal twins. And all males are going to uh, cooperate to rear the young. Um, and specifically, the, their primary caregivers in terms of carrying the young, which have to be carried everywhere for 10 weeks. And they're extremely heavy. So, so a tamarind litter weighs about 20% of adult body mass at birth and increases to 50%. Um, and so just for allometric scaling comparisons. This is as if a 130-pound female human had twins that weighed a total of 26 pounds at birth. So, so very, very heavy indeed. Um, and so, so this was striking to me because um, males, um, in, in, at least as you've, if you view it through the traditional conception of males, they're paying sort of two costs. Um, they're losing reproductive opportunities because they're mating with one female. And they're caring for young, and possibly for young that is not their own, because there's another male involved here. Yet they have these very, very pro-social relationships. Um, so uh, I wanted to um, study field populations. And I went out and studied free-ranging tamarinds in Panama. And I used uh, molecular genetics to get at some of these classic hypotheses for cooperative breeding. And so first I tested. Um, the idea, and these are sort of the major hypotheses, and I tested mainly the two, first two. Um, first is the indirect fitness benefits hypothesis, which is the idea that males are related, um, so they're actually helping to pass their genes indirectly through their related offspring. Um, and the other one is that males um, help in carrying young because they actually sire offspring in the group. Um, and the other one is that males are perhaps queuing up for a future reproductive opportunity um, when a main breeder leaves. And so jumping right in, um, what I'm going to show you here is a graph with uh, relatedness on the, on the y-axis. Relatedness is a proportion of genes that two individuals share. Um, and we expect that to be about half for a sibling relationship, half for a mother-son uh, offspring. 
Um, and so the different bars are different populations that I study. And if you look at the background uh, pa average pairwise relatedness of the whole population or of all the population males, so appropriately those are low. Um, and the males, the adult males that are co-residents in a group um, have high relatedness. And that relatedness is uh, sort of indistinguishable, statistically indistinguishable from a uh, mother offspring relationship, which is a known relationship that, that we have. Um, and, and so the, the numbers that we get back are, are consistent with very close uh, relationships. And, and the only other studies that are out there that have used uh, genetics um, in wild populations um, are from uh, Marin Huck and others from Eckhart Heyman's group and Sandra Suarez um, in Saguinus labiatus. And so in these closely related Saguinus tamarin species, um, we actually get similar numbers as well. Um, and so are males gaining paternity there um, in those groups? So what you'll have here on the y-axis is basically the number of different fathers in a group. And then um, the different colors are going to be the different groups. So if you look at one year, what you'll see is that it seems that one male is dominating reproduction in most of the groups. And if you expand your time horizon um, to, to other years, you see that in some groups at least you have additional males gaining paternity. Right? And so this is you know, not enough to say that there's a trend, but the, 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 the point why I think this is an important result is because we usually draw inferences about paternity on what I think is a, short, a too short time scale um, to figure out what lifetime reproductive success is. So even in my study, which was you know, a handful of years, um, two or three years, um, these things live, uh, tamarins live about 20 years. Um, so, so we really need to expand our time horizon there. And so I found uh, support for these two hypotheses, but you know, this is just basically the, the bare minimum to see if they're possible. Um, and so I wanted to talk about the, the partnerships um, and, and, and reinforce the importance of looking at multi-year periods um, because these partnerships are actually long. And we know from demographic studies of other uh, saguina species, um, particularly par Paul Garber's studies of Saguinus mystax, that the partnerships can be very long, four to eight years. Um, so these males stick together. Um, and, and, and they're very cooperative. I want to emphasize that. So these males, um, you know, they will, they will not only carry the young together, but they will groom each other, and they will mate right in front of each other with the female. So they're very cooperative. And we have some evidence that perhaps this relatedness that showed up in the genetic data between the males might be a requisite for forming groups. And in a great study by Colleen Schaffner and Jeff French, although in marmosets, what they showed is that you basically need that relatedness um, to form uh, polyandrous groups in captivity. Um, so I did the study, and I was thinking, well, what other mammal has sort of a similar mating system? And um, I came up with only one answer, uh, which are certain cultural groups in uh, the Himalayas, mainly, in India and Tibet, um, that have what is known as fraternal polyandry. So two brothers uh, marry a single female and help to rear her young. Um, so, so very similar. And, and, and I really started this, this study from the perspective of understanding uh, male cooperation in animals. So it was, it was sort of surprising and cool to, to see that there was a connection to humans. Um, and and, and there's, there's anthropological work that I wasn't really aware of until I uh, heard a talk by Sarah Hardy that humans uh, might have had a uh, cooperatively breeding past, our ancestors. Um, and, and, and as I mentioned earlier, tamarins and marmosets, the calatricans, are really only the, full, the only full-fledged uh, cooperative breeders um, in nature. So I think that we can gain some comparative insight um, into our own uh, human cooperation. OK, so now I want to talk about the females. Um, OK, so I told you about the males and gave you sort of a simplified diagram of what the social structure is like. Um, but there are other individuals in this group, aside from these fraternal twins. Um, there can be multiple males. There are also multiple adult females that are there, right? You recall I told you there were three to nine individuals. 
um, and you know other uh, group members immigrate too. So there's there's some complexity there. And I showed you a picture of and I painted a picture of harmonious male cooperation, right? This this really sort of hippie free love um, image of males. Um, and we know in other primate uh, uh, societies, particularly in baboons, but in, in many other groups, female affiliation is really important to, to fitness, and social bonds between females are really important, right? So I'm going to tell you that female tamarins are really, really nice to each other, right? Not quite. <laughs> so I've already hinted by calling one of the females and singling them out as a breeding female that there is there's some skew here in, in, in dominance. And, and if you look at the number of offspring, this is easier because we don't have to use genetics, but I've used genetics as well. And, and, and in my population, there's only one female that, that dominates reproduction. So the subordinates are in green or would be if they had any young in the groups. Um, and these, these breeding females, uh, the subordinate females are there. And not only are they not gaining direct reproduction, but they're also subject to hormonal and behavioral harassment from the breeding female. And I like this plot, and it, it's an old plot, and there's, and there's more recent studies. But this is um, from captivity, and it really illustrates the point of hormonal reproduction. You don't have to be an endocrinologist to see that there's a flat line. And then when you remove the female, which is that dotted line there, the, the subordinate female starts cycling again. right? Um, so this, this effect is less pronounced in the wild. Um, and behavioral mechanisms are probably more important. Um, and in tamarins, we get instances of, we think that this leads to group dissolution. Um, but in marmosets, we actually have multiple documented reports of female to female infanticide. Um, and, and so I, we have no reports on tamarins, though, which suggests that they have another mechanism of sort of resolving that conflict, if that is what leads to conflict. But I think it's striking that a rare behavior or a, Behavior that is hard to observe, like infanticide, is, is, has been documented in the literature so many times. So these females, these subordinate females, are subject to harassment. Um, they don't get, gain direct fitness. So why are they sticking around? So I, uh, again, went back and did sort of a similar analysis as I did to the males and tried to figure out if these breeding females are related. And this is a similar plot to the one I showed you later. And in fact, they are related. And if I go back to the published data for the other Seguina species and populations that we have, uh, we also ha find that they have some level of high relatedness, too. So there's some relatives. At least. This is on average, right? So there's a lot of these relations. Go ahead. Clarifying. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no problem. Um, you're curious about uh, yeah. these are these are these what? correlation? I mean, are these are. Uh, these are microsatellite. Uh, so how do you get negative relatedness? Base. I guess is my question. <laughs> so oh, it's 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 on average, right? So so your position um, at, at at getting a, you know, you don't you won't always get 0.5, right? As you get more and more markers, then you converge on that, which is why I show, for example, the known the known mother offspring relationship. You'll see that has a large bound. So you're trying to sort of parameterize how it looks on these markers that you have that you have used. So this is based on seven uh, microsatellite loci. So that's that's why basically. And at the population level you expect it to be around zero, but you're gonna have some individuals that are neg uh, that are le so less expected than related to the average of the population. Right? It's it's all these are all relative and they depend highly on the marker basically. OK, so, so why do these females stay in the group then? Um, um, direct fitness, are not, fitness benefits are not a possibility when the breeder is around. Um, and indirect fitness benefits are a possibility. But they're, you know, I'm, as, as I'm trying to say, these are sort of just the bare minimum for, for these, uh, to test these hypotheses. And, and there are other benefits. And an important one is experience in infant rearing uh, uh, for future fitness. Um, so we know from various sources that inexperienced mothers um, can experience really significant mortality in that first litter. So, and, and that completely erases if, if the females get um, some infant rearing experience. So there, there are other uh, benefits. Okay, so, I, so I've painted two pictures, uh, one of competition, 
suppression and infanticide, the other one about caring, cooperation, and prosociality. And those are respectively ascribed to females and males in tamarins. And so some people would call these reverse sex roles um, um, because usually we think of uh, caring females and competing males. And so part of the question is, why, why do we consider these roles reversed and why is male competition sort of the default expectation? Um, and, and so the question is, what, what leads to sex role divergence? Um, and, and all these ideas that I'm going to present um, in this sort of introductory part are based on a great paper by Hannah Coco and Michael Jennings in Journal of Evolutionary Biology, where they really try to go systematically through what are the explanations that have been proposed for this and develop a theoretical model to actually test them. Um, and so, so we'll talk about sex role divergence in the conventional sense and what, what could, what could, what could uh, do that. So the first thing that, that is mentioned, and, and this was popularized uh, by, mainly by Trivers, by Robert Trivers, is an isogamy, right? So the idea is that females generate these big, really expensive to make, and limited gametes. And males produce these really small uh, gametes that are cheap to produce, right? Um, and so the argument was that females stand to lose this investment um, in their eggs and, and, and that males produce it cheaply so they, don't, so they can afford to go around. So the problem with this argument is that there's a lot of things that happen afterwards to get to successful reproduction. And it also commits what behavioral ecologists call the conquered fallacy, which is that your future, your past investment affects your future decisions, which is just sort of not how evolution really works. It doesn't look in the rear view mirror. Um, and the other um, explanation is the operational sex ratio. And so the idea is that a male bias, and again, we're talking about conventional sex roles, that a male bias in the operational sex ratio, and that is the ratio of receptive or sexually active females to sexually active males, means that males should invest more in mating competition, right? And so. This is fine, but it, sexual selection has to be very, very strong, and the, and the difference in the competitive abilities of males has to be very strong to override what's called the Fisher condition. And that's simply that each of these males needs, on average, one female to reproduce. Right? So, so, so basically, that will lead to frequency-dependent selection if caring your, your young um, increases your fitness. So then it it basically goes against the idea that males should compete. And so an additional factor um, that was actually initially mentioned by Trevor's but has been pretty ignored, pretty much ignored, is the adult sex ratio. And this is something that comes out in the theoretical mo model by, by Coco and Jennings, um, which is um, that males become uh, rare in the population, presumably because competing is costly and causes differential mortality. And then you do have an advantage of investing in traits for competition because you're like, you have less competitors. And so I, basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on this last explanation and see if there's any evidence for it in, in tamarins. Um, and, and really I was sort of inspired by this, by this quote from the Genians paper, um, which, is, um, which I thought was really fit really well with the tamarin situation. And it says, even if multiple paternity reduces the benefits of ma that males gain by caring, um, which is the situation in tamarins because there's multiple female mating, male bias care might still evolve if the adult sex ratio is sufficiently male bias that you gain by caring an offspring, right? So uh, my questions were, is there evidence for reproductive competition, in particular differential reproductive competition between the sexes? Um, is the adult sex ratio biased? and towards which sex. And this is work that I'm uh, currently preparing for publication. And again, it draws from the other published uh, studies on other Saguana species. So, so these are going to be aggregates of three uh, different studies. Um, so what I found was that there are no sex differences in variance in reproductive success. Um, and so the way to think about this chart is that you have a lot of females and males on, the, on, on your left of the screen that are getting no offspring, right? And some way out here that are getting a lot of offspring, right? Um, so that, that seemed to me to be at odds with the idea that there is a lot of these sexually active males. And it seemed like the, the variance in reproductive success should be 
smaller. So what I tried to do was look at the local level of, of reproductive competition and look at um, reproductive skew within groups. Um, and so I use uh, an index of reproductive skew, um, which basically says whether reproduction is equitable or not, um, which is known XP um, by Peter Nonex, which many of you might know. Um, and, and what I found was that, that at least in some of these populations, females clearly have more skewed reproduction, but these values are actually not significantly different. Um, I think, I have an intuition that maybe this is a, 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 a result of the fact that we only have snapshots of male reproduction, um, as I mentioned earlier. So I think if you look at a longer time scale and sample something that's closer to the uh, average lifespan of individuals, maybe males are less. But let's call it no reproductive competition because that's what the data say. Um, and then I, I looked at the uh, adult group sex ratio. So this is within a group, on average, how many males, how many females do you have? Um, at the primary sex ratio basically is unbiased. So um, if you don't include adults, only uh, non-adults, there's no significant difference. Um, the, there's no difference in the sex ratio of successful breeders either, suggesting perhaps that, that again, there's not, uh, that they're equally um, competitive in reproduction. And then when we look at the adults, there's this very significant skew towards males in groups. So on average, basically, there are two males for each females in the group. So that's a pretty um, big deviation of the sex ratio. Um, so what I think this, this suggests is that um, there, there are no differences in reproductive competition with the caveat that I, that I uh, uh, mentioned earlier. Um, and Female mortality results in a male, uh, and this is differential mortality after um, the juvenile stage, um, results in, in a male bias adult sex ratio. And I don't have any evidence, but presumably this is caused by female reproductive competition and the stress of competing for reproductive positions, but it could be due to other things. And then this adult uh, uh, male bias adult sex ratio uh, leads to males gaining more from competing, uh, from investing in care than from competing. And so I didn't want to leave the impression that females are all conflict and males are all cooperation. Females are also extremely cooperative. They help to rear young, just like any other group member. Um, and they help on all other aspects of the group. And males are also competitive. And in particular, they have really marked differences in testes size. And so we haven't been able to, to link this directly to reproductive success um, because it basically requires for you to be there at conception and at birth to measure both the testes size and the paternity, which has been challenging. But what we do know is that there's always one male in the group that has a much higher testes volume than, than all of its mates. And work by Paul Garber showed the same thing and in addition showed that there are seasonal variations in this corresponding to the, to the, to the mating uh, peaks. There's not a D distinct breeding season, but the mating peaks. Um, and we also know that the testes size for tamarind is way larger than you would expect for its body size, suggesting, again, that sperm competition is very likely. And I think it's an understudied aspect of the system. So I want to talk to you a little bit about mating systems now. Um, so in our culture, uh, meaning US, European cultures, uh, we're uh, you know, uh, nominally monogamous and, and very invested in the concept of monogamy. Um, but what is monogamy exactly? How do we define monogamy? Um, and we think that there are some traits, basically, that are associated with monogamy including sort of uh, different measures of what's called the pair bond, so spatial proximity, um, distress upon separation, mate guarding, um, and of course mating exclusivity and, and that that mating exclusivity trend, trends is absolute, leading to genetic fidelity in terms of the offspring. Um, and so these, these traits are all uh, part of what Agustin Fuentes called the monogamy package, which I think is a really nifty term. Um, and, and, and what I'm leading at is that there's, there's all these uh, traits 
that are, that are ascribed to this one system. And, and I'll tell you why that becomes important a little bit later. Um, but why am I talking about monogamy when I just told you about all this polyandry between the tamarins? Well, the issue is that calatricans were once thought to be monogamous. Um, and I think that the history of how the, the, the idea of the mating system going from monogamy to something else really illustrates uh, some important concepts, uh, some important shortcomings of the concept of monogamy and the definition of mating systems. Um, so early on, the calatricans were thought to be monogamous um, because they exhibited a lot of these traits that are part of the monogamy package, right? So this was very, uh, very logical and very reasonable and consistent. And so with the benefit of hindsight, as a young brash grad student, um, I, I thought, well, you know, if you put them, a male and a female in a cage, they have no other option but to be monogamous, right? Um, because a lot of these studies were based in captivity. And, and I partly also had that, that position because from early on, it was clear that you could keep uh, tamarins in polyandrous trios in captivity. And there was actually evidence that some of those groups were more stable than monogamous groups. And of course, we now have experimental confirmation of that um, from a captive study. So my question had always been, it sort of always was an open question to me, why didn't this idea catch on if there was data for it and it was reasonably consistent? And why was there this resistance to the idea of polyandry? Now this type of image for us is sort of scandalous, but I was like, these, these are monkeys, you know? Why, why, do, you, why do you care, right? It should not matter. Um, and as I mentioned before, um, uh, I think data has a way of shining through, and the field studies uh, clearly indicated that calatricans were not monogamous. Um, and in particular, pioneering work by Ann Goldison showed that a lot of these groups are, in fact, polyandrous. But later on, she also found that there is a lot of flexibility in the mating behavior, right? And so you get everything from monogamy to polyandry to polygynandry to polygyny, right? Um, so, so I started thinking, I was like, well, maybe that brash comment was, that snide comment was not completely fair, and maybe the monogamy set was actually onto something. And I think, um, and this in particular, because my mistake was that the male and the female in the cage had one more option, which was not breeding at all, right? And, and we know the difficulties that some animals have breeding in captivity, um, and and animals are very finicky about doing anything in captivity and starting with survival, right? A lot of species you just can't keep in captivity. And so I want to point you to a great review by uh, Khaleesi and Bentley talking about the hormonal uh, differences that, fem uh, that captive and, and, and field-based studies. Um, and and so, so I, what I've come to realize now is that keeping tamarins in captivity um, was sort of an ecological experiment. Um, and it really presaged some uh, current theories, some current theoretical studies that we have about the evolution of polyandry. And if, you, and if you model the conditions that lead to polyandry, it turns out that resources are very critical in that. And so if you have few resources, the probability of polyandry increases. And this is consistent with what, with what we saw with the calatricans um, in captivity. So we're virtually certain that calatricans don't breed in lone pairs in the wild, um, or that it's just very, very rare. Um, but you put them in captivity, and they will happily uh, live as lone pairs and reproduce. Um, and so something you have to know is that calatricans are about this size, and they travel for uh, their daily path length is about 1.2 kilometers. So something like this travels 1.2 kilometers every day. Um, to get their resources. So you reduce those travel distances, give them all the resources they need, and they happily live um, in captivity. Um, and, and it sort of works the other way around. So gibbons, which we think of as monogamous primates, um, some field work by uh, Savini et al. showed that you actually get in lower quality territories, you get some polyandrous groups, and the probability of those polyandrous groups occurring actually increases. And you see that in other species as well, such as the bearded vultures. Um, and satisfyingly, um, we also have some evidence um, that this also happens in human groups. And so the, 
part of the explanation uh, proposed for why fraternal polyandry exists is that these are areas um, in the Himalayas that are where it's extremely difficult to do agriculture, right? And so uh, if, if a father has an estate um, and has two sons, you don't want to divide the estate because basically it, it, you, know, you lose it after a couple of generations. So it was a mechanism to keep those, that limited resource of the arable land sort of within the family. And what we see is that, that when other ways of living um, arose, then, then the, the, the polyandry tradition started fading. Um, so this is consistent um, with, with, with the same scenario in animals. And, and the, the message is that flexibility is really key. Um, and we're getting back to some of the really, really fundamental questions of social organization um, and how ecology influences social organization. Um, questions originally proposed by Crook and Sealander and others. Um, so uh, what is the mating system of calotrichins? Um, uh, I'm going to redirect that question. Um, I'm going to say that we need to know in this complex group, what's, uh, keep track of what's going on socially. So who is living with who? Who is interacting with who? Um, who is mating with who? What's going on sexually? And who is producing offspring with whom? I think that's a more uh, healthy way to, to do it. So, so what I wanted to do is, is look at those questions through this lens um, and, and, and provide a, a model for what I think is happening in tamarind groups. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to think about how does a tamarind group form? It's sort of a conceptual exercise. Um, and, and, it's, and it's sort of basically just my ideas, but there's, there's some data to back up some of these statements. Um, and, and, and these ideas are heavily influenced by a, a model of the evolution of polyandry proposed by Chow. So how do you start a group, right? Um, you have a lone female male pair, right? And they can't reproduce on their own, at least not in the wild, right? So what do you do? You can add a female, right? But the male has, can, is perfectly capable of inseminating both females, so now you have four bundles of joy to take care of that are very heavy, right? Um, so you doubled your problem. And we know that there's this reproductive competition, group dissolution, and infanticide that can occur. So you add another male. And we have some evidence that these males have to be related. Um, and then you get your group. And then these offspring sometimes delay dispersal. So you get the growing of the group. And, in other, uh, and then you get immigrants and other individuals coming in too. So the point is that it's a, it's a complex uh, cast of characters. And, and I think by um, what happens is as the group has more, uh, more helping hands, it can afford to do variations on the theme of polyandry. So basically, um, when, you, when the group has grown to a sufficient size, the constraint on having another male to help for offspring is not there. And that's where you get some of the monogamous groups. Um, and, and you can do, and I think a lot of the intraspecific and interspecific variation in the calotrichinae um, can be usefully viewed through, through this lens. And that's sort of what I'm, what I'm attempting to do with, with this uh, paper. Um, so, so I would say that polyandry is the modal mating system, if you will, um, of tamarinds. And, and, and a common objection from the monogamy set about this is, well, you know, maybe one male monopolizes all reproduction and then they're basically effectively monogamous. Um, and so I, I think the problem with this statement is, one, what I told you about, uh, before about you know, we don't have enough data on the male paternity. And the, the second point is that I think behavior matters. So, so the fact that that paternity is skewed does not negate the fact that there is another male uh, mating there. So behavior matters. And I think if we anthropomorphize for a second, um, you can maybe see this point. And so the, the, the all paternities are all that matters um, uh, perspective would hardly be convincing in the human context, right? Um, and, and so I think that the behavior is really important um, to the social organization. And so in the end, all this squabbling for ma about mating systems gets sort of exciting in the literature and whatnot. But we have to stand back at one point and ask ourselves, does it matter? Right? Um, 
I don't think it matters. I think uh, evolution is blind to mating systems. So it's not like monogamy is a trait that selection can act upon or polyandry or polygyny, at least as we have it conceived right now. And, and I think we have to remember that mating systems are heuristic tools that we use as, as humans to categorize behaviors. Um, and, and, and if we hurt, they hurt more than they help, then we need to toss them and think about uh, other things that matters. And, and, uh, and that leads me to the questions, uh, do mating systems exist? And I'll leave this mainly as a rhetorical question um, but I'll, I'll, I'll basically say that, that I think what is important is to think of uh, is the traits um, and, and focus on, on the things that evolution can actually act on. And I think this is important because we've had some recent papers talking about the evolution of monogamy that have generated an, an, an enormous amount of interest and discussion both in sort of the popular press and, 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 and the, the general public and in the, in the literature, um, and, and they can't, came up um, with contrasting explanations of why monogamy evolves. And I think part of this is due to our definition of monog monogamy and not focusing on a trait that you can actually uh, measure. And, and so that's one problem that could theoretically be circumvented. But I think the other problem is what I've been talking to you about and what I think the Tamarins illustrate really well is that there is variability and that variability responds to environmental conditions. Um, so I think if we're going to make an evolutionary argument, we have to be very careful and mind the phenotypic plasticity gap. We need to be aware of what things are obligate and what things are facultative and flexible and how those things relate to, um, uh, how those traits relate to ecological conditions again, uh, across taxa, physiological mechanisms, and then, and then we can look at the phylogenetic history um, and properly analyze some of these things. And so I think the relative roles of ecology and behavioral plasticity are something that, that have been uh, undervalued here. Okay, so in summary, uh, I've told you about how uh, males uh, compete, females, uh, or sorry, males cooperate, females compete. There's these atypical sex roles, and we have this whole history of, of, of the conception of the mating system, and I hope I've, I've told you a little bit about how um, this is relevant for us to understand uh, mating behavior. Um, and, and stepping back on my, on my two take-home messages, um, first is um, I think Social interactions and, and, and the balance between conflict of, and cooperation are really important for understanding uh, sexual behavior, as I mentioned. Um, so that's my first message that I hope you take home and I have convinced you of. And the second one is um, that as scientists, we need to be aware of what our cultural biases are and how those affect our receptivity to um, interpretations and data that we get um, and, and how we view the diversity of sexual behavior. And so uh, I showed you that at one point in certain it's US and European scientific circles, the idea of tamarins being polyandrous was very controversial. However, that would be hardly be surprising in India, right? Um, so the Sanskrit epic talks about uh, Dropadi. Um, who had five husbands, which were princes, the Pandava brothers. Um, and, and I think, in some sense, we're, we're sort of slaves to our, to our current social environment, but I think as scientists, we try to find things that, that make us open to other, um, to other interpretations. And I think a good inoculum against this is having a diverse social uh, scientific enterprise and having diversity. And, and to drive home that point, I did not know the story of Draupadi. I went to CSU Fresno and gave a talk, and Professor Marukadi and Professor Mantarawat told me about this story, about how it's, inter how it's a part of their cultural story. And interestingly, in India is where you get these fraternal uh, polyandry cultures. So there's this reinforcement between biology and culture um, that really um, t 
tells us something about mating behaviors. Um, and I want to leave you with a really broad view. It's really exciting to talk about, you know, which monkeys mate with who, um, if you're interested in that type of thing. But what is the broader relevance about uh, cooperation? Um, and I think that this theoretical uh, preoccupation actually has some practical applications. And so uh, the WHO recently released a report talking about antibiotic resistance. So we've been favoring individuals and really giving them a lot of uh, antibiotics indiscriminately. And that sort of led to uh, what could be called a tragedy of the commons in, in resistance. So, so I think um, if we think about sort of the individual and the collective and, and apply some of the knowledge we have, we can, we can come up with some uh, practical solutions if we think about it through that lens. Um, and keeping with a broad view of cooperation, I mentioned Kropotkin earlier. Um, in his book, Mutual Aid, he talked about how we should be prepared to learn that there are facts of unconscious mutual support, that is cooperation, even from the life of microorganisms. And he really foreshadowed a, a, you know, an explosion really of, of studies in microbes that, use, uh, that study cooperation and conflict and, and highlight the importance of, of social interactions in microbes. Um, so I'm following sort of my advice about keeping a broad view. Um, and I'm moving from monkeys to microbes. And in my more recent postdoctoral work, um, I have been looking at social evolution and viruses. I'll be giving a talk on this topic tomorrow in the life sciences building. So if you're interested in that, let me know and I'll point you in the right direction. Um, and I just want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Eileen Lacey, my doctoral advisor at the Museum of Urban Zoology at UC Berkeley, um, and her whole lab, which is really a great community for thinking about th these things. I had the privilege of working with uh, two of my long-term field assistants, uh, Maribel Tejada and Angel Sosa, who were instrumental in getting the Tamarin work going. And, and, and I have a great community of, of, of researchers, great minds that, that have really deeply influenced my thoughts. And I wanted to thank NSF for funding my crazy ideas. Um, and to you for the invitation and for listening. Thank you very much. I think he was first. <laughs> Thank you, Sam, for this slide. We'll talk. I have so many questions. Um, but the, the first one, um, you, you said that there wasn't a difference in the variance and reproductive success for the males. Is that correct? Uh, between the males and the females. Sorry, I didn't make that point clear. Uh, that is, a variance in, in female reproductive success is not statistically significantly different from the male variance in reproductive success. What about within the males? You didn't no, I didn't say anything up. Uh, let me see. Right, right. So there's clearly, there's clearly, basically, there's clearly evidence for reproductive skew in both, but but the but the magnitude of those differences is not is not significantly different. Does that make sense? Between not the male and females. Yeah. Right, right, yeah. right. I was just trying to get an idea of of whether. The males uh, were under stronger, or the females in particular, that was my a, a, a priori hypothesis, that the females would be under stronger uh, reproductive competition and would have more skew in their reproduction and there would be more variance in reproductive success. And so the, the part of the reason, if I can elaborate for a second, um, why I think um, that the variance in male reproductive success might end up being lower is because we actually have the long-term data for females because you just, you just count offspring. And we know that over the long term, um, in, in some populations of tamarins, you get 50% of the females that don't reproduce at all. And so that's, that's over, over long, uh, decade long periods um, of, of sampling. And so I think uh, the males have more opportunities to reproduce. And I think if we do paternity over longer time scales, that'll probably be reduced somewhat. But I, I don't know. That's my speculation. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if my confusion, I haven't read the Coco and yeah. papers, so mm -hmm. I don't know if my confusion is with their thesis or with the way that you're applying it, but so you, you, said, you said that um, that the sex ratio in adulthood is skewed because of 
female mortality, and you attribute that to female competition. Well, um, it could be. I have no evidence. Right, so yeah. you speculated yeah. that it was. Um, uh, and, and my confusion then is in, in, in the, it seems tautological to me to yeah. say, yeah. To say um, the, that a skewed sex ratio is responsible for um, the sex difference in competitiveness right. because the yield on competition is greater, the number of potential competitors is lower, um, and that it is competition that is responsible for skewed sex ratio. Right. As I can see how Right. Maybe you can get positive feedback loops between those right. two things where, where right. they'll exacerbate each other. But at de novo, the two can't be, at time zero, the two can't be mutually causal. Right. Right. Um, uh, so, 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 so part of the issue is that, that I didn't do a great job of, of explaining the Coco and Jennings paper, in part because um, something they mention is that all these things interact. So the, the operational sex ratio interacts with the adult sex ratio, and all these things interact, and that's part, part of their point of their paper, that, that, that these things interact, and that's why you need models. Um, and so one thing that I'll tell you maybe that will, that addresses the tautology, the tautology issue is that they didn't actually include the adult sex ratio explicitly in the model. It emerged as something that was a factor in in, in driving the sex roles, um, mainly through, and so it's associated with the with the operational sex ratio as well. Um, but but these things interact, and there are loops. So so maybe maybe it is too strong to say that it's caused by it. Um, and so the model, maybe to step back, what it does is that it it's a it's called a time in time out model, and what it does is it 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 uh. It talks about the time, it quantifies the time caring and the time competing, and then models the effect if one is more costly than the other. And so that's really where it emerges from. So I don't know if that addresses. Yeah, okay. So I, I, the summary is I don't know that that's the case, and right now it does appear tautologically. I think it's because we need to know right, way that. more details yeah, about that. Yeah. And, and, I, and, I, and I think what I was trying to do is see if there was some evidence. That, that that was a possible factor with, with that affected sex roles. I mean, it seems like there are other possibilities that, right. um, say, given the high birth weight and the obligate twinning, that um, uh, maternal depletion is a possibility, right. that, um, uh, that just um, uh, sort of perinatal trauma is a possibility. There are mm -hmm. lots of things that contribute absolutely. to a skewed sex ratio. Oh, absolutely. Greater female, female direct. Yeah, it's no, different. for sure. Am I remembering correctly that you said there is um, reproductive suppression of the subordinate females? That's you said right. there was, right? Yeah. So I'm wondering, it, it seems like polyandry is a, is a nice response to that suppression, right? In that, so if if because the, the actual the operational sex ratio is such that that if you've got reproductive suppression right you've got these females who are essentially off the market right, right? so now you um, you have this male biased operational sex ratio and it's better to have one of the twins right of this of the dominant female uh, because you can't add it because those other if you just use the adult sex ratio that that assumes that those other females are available for mating, but are just not mating for some reason, and that's right. not the case, right? right? So if you think about right. polyandry in this case as a response to the suppression, then it might make sense as to why that might emerge as a, as a stable strategy. Right. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Now that was the answer. Yeah. Sorry. No, 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 I, I agree. Okay. Um, I want to talk about the obligate twinning. I mean, is it is it true they can't have one? Well, so, yeah, so they've, they've actually, there's very, very old um, embryological studies, um, and, and, and I'm not a developmental biologist, but what I, what I glean from them is that, is that basically twinning always happens, um, but in the wild and in captivity, there's always mortality, um, pre, you know, pre-birth mortality, and that, and that. So you get singletons all the time, 
Um, but apparently, <coughs> embryologically, it develops always as a as a twin. I mean, and in most animal species, they actually um, produce more than will survive, and there's kind of a survival of the fittest in the nest. Or right. In early development is you know, or even in lactation. Um, do you see any? I mean, do you, do you yeah, it's not something that I make two to get one sometimes, or how how often do two survive in the wild? And then if there's only one male for a female, um, can one survive? Uh, that's that's a good question, and I'm not I'm not sure to the answer a second question. I didn't I didn't study uh, infant survival specifically, but twins certainly do survive in, in the in the in the wild. So, so it's not it's not rare, right? I don't think so. It's not like you see what I can tell you at least anecdotally and really I mean, in the literature. Um, it's not like you have this mortality such that the distribution at birth is you get mostly two and then you only get mostly one surviving. So they, I think I think mainly they're successful at getting that, but you know, I don't know how successful they are at that. But did you see females um, produce any offspring that only had one adult male available? No. So so the one study uh, which is by, by Tammy Wimfelder, um, they she had observations of lone em, 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 a lone male and female emperor tamarind rearing young, and they went up to the six-month period. Um, but, but then the field season ended, and we, we really don't know what, what happened. And we also don't know exactly what, the, 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 what happened before that either. So, so it could be that there was a male there, and the male left, or yeah. But, but those two... A single male and a single female are exceedingly rare but in, so in, in, the, in the world. So in your study where you've got the paternity, mm -hmm. how often um, the twins have different fathers? As so that's, that's an interesting question. Um, I found one case, and the other two studies that um, have used paternity as well also found one case. So it's, so we're, so it's rare, but it happens, and it happens at a constant frequency. Um, because given our sample sizes in all of these studies, um, and mine, mine was on the smaller side, the fact that we're picking it up means that it's at a high enough frequency that we didn't miss it due to sampling. So I, I think it's, it's low, but it, it does happen. And then for the co-fathers, um, is there sort of one who's the lead father and the other who's the backup father? Behaviorally, no. Um, it's different in lion tamarins, for example. Lion tamarins do have strict dominance hierarchies, and there's evidence of uh, male takeovers where uh, two of the male partners would go in and oust other males, so sort of like the lion story. Um, in Seguinus tamarins, as far as we can tell, there's no differences behaviorally. Um, there's no differences in their hormones and their circulating blood hormones either. So as far as we can tell, um, they're pretty equitable. Yeah, uh, just a few basic questions. Yeah. Uh, group size? Uh, three to nine. Okay. Of tamarins, so why is tamarins? Yeah. yeah. Uh, interbirth interval? Uh, 100, oh, gestation, 150 days, give or take. Okay, so, so you said the relationships are lasting approximately four to six years. How many? The relationships of the, of the males. So the oh, males, okay. Sorry. So the males uh, will stay to get, if there's a pair, for example, um, or the, although there are trios of related males, um, that they they will stay together for those years. But what's interesting is that they, they might they might not necessarily stay in the same group. So so there is evidence that they that they move either in paired migration, or or sort of one leaves and then they reunite eventually in the in the same group. So there's evidence for for this uh, parallel disp dispersal phenomenon. One, one more. Yeah. Uh, classic socioecology. And I'm it, sorry it, to put those <laughs> up in the back. To what extent it might female uh, competition be linked to uh, resource competition? I mean, fruit eating, right? Yeah. So. Clump dispersed, to what extent? Resources? Yeah. I think very dispersed. Um, in terms of, 
I mean, I think that they have various uh, sources. Um, so they're omnivores. They have about, you know, 40% is insect protein. Okay. You no, know, 40% is um, uh, fruits. Um, and you have a 10% of, of sap. They actually are, uh, use exudates as food. And, and there's an interesting, actually, socio-ecological difference between tamarins and marmosets mm -hmm. in that marmosets have the dentition that makes them able to gouge holes mm -hmm. in trees. And so we generally, generally see lower uh, home range size for marmosets in bigger groups. Um, and, and some people have proposed that that's um, because of that, that they have that year-round resource that they can exploit. Um, the, but the insects and the, and the fruits are going to be, you know, dispersed and highly seasonal, especially highly seasonal. Um, so at least in, in Panama, there's a really prolonged uh, or pronounced uh, dry to wet season. Um, so, I mean, I think, I think there's, if you're saying that the reproductive competition is about reproduction, I, I sort of view it as intertwined with the resources because you need to carry those youngs and you need to get the calories to, you know, so I, I think I view them very as very linked. So I think competition over resources is, is very important and, and almost, and that's, that's what's sort of mediating it. And, and, and the, the cost of, of the offspring sort of amplifies that. Right. But yeah. Just to follow up on that, though, yeah. I feel like there's a very important piece of data there that you didn't mention, which mm -hmm. is that reproductive suppression of females in captivity is almost absolute, and there's That's true. no resource scarcity in right. captivity. Um, That's true. So. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of things to, for me to think about. <laughs> this is why we give these talks. So I'm 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 uh, sensitive to the both the ambiguity about what we mean by mating systems, the mm -hmm. definitional criteria that seem to vary, and also the point about the cultural frame which leads us to interpret behavior in light of some prior suppositions we might have. So both of those are perfectly valid points. I'm not challenging those. Instead, um, uh, if, we, if we go back to Darwin and sexual selection, mm -hmm. right, um, uh, you know, classically the investment in armaments like the buck that you showed at the beginning of your talk, right, um, uh, is explicable in terms of the payoff that, it, that comes with reproductive skew. Right? Mm -hmm. So right. these are the, the, the animals that you're describing are, are um, not sexually dimorphic in body size. Um, they don't have, I mean, on the scale of primates, they're, yeah. they're right? They're yeah, other primates, right. They're essentially right. identical with yeah. males and females. Right. Um, I don't know about their dentition, you tell me, but my yeah. impression is that they're not highly dimorphic there either. Right. And those are things that in primates we see as, as, um, uh, as tracking um, combat competition. Right. right? Um, and you told us that there's no difference in the variance in reproductive success between the males and the females, at least within the time window that your yeah. sample yep. captures, right? So it doesn't seem like it's a big stretch to say not in terms of their behavior, and if by a mating system we mean something about their behavior, but defined strictly in terms of the relationship between variance in reproductive success and, and sexual selection pressure, this is a monogamous species in the sense that they are effectively monogamous by virtue of the fact that there's no difference in the variance between the sexes in um, reproductive success. And that tracks with or explains their morphology and that there isn't selection for armaments um, in one sex or the other. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me that all the caveats about being cautious about the mating system and recognizing that they're helpers at the nest and that sometimes males are, are um, sharing paternity in, in uh, twin litters, um, those are sort of reasons, they're qualifiers, but they're not reasons to discard the notion that this is a monogamous species if we're defining monogamy in terms of uh, variance in reproductive success across the sexes and its consequences for sexual selection. Sure. Yeah, I, 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 I think, yeah, so I'm, 
No, no, no. And, and this came up. I, I sent I sent my a draft of my paper to Hannah Coker, and she did mention that point. I think. I feel a lot better. I think my <laughs> I think my my because you see when I when I did the the sex ratios and 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 they were they're about um, the breeders were about even, um, and there was one one. Um, that point is well taken. I think my caution is more that most people don't talk about that when they're talking about monogamy. Right, that there's, the, the word is polysimous. It, it, right. it, it, it's it's underspecified. Right. Different people mean different things by mating right. system. Right. right, so for example, in these in these recent monogamy papers, in the OB et al. paper, in the Lucas and Cullen Brock paper, um, there's no measure of, you know, variance and reproductive success that's objective and will tell you something then that you can use as an evolutionary argument. Right. Yeah, so, that's why. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So, Lynn, you had objections. Well, I want to yeah, hear what you. Because the monogamy is one male, one female. I mean that. It's Not no. So by the pair of that, that depends. <laughs> what, it, 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 <laughs> exactly. it depends what you mean by monogamy. So if you mean social monogamy, um, right. and, and, and you know, Sam had a, a, sort of a constellation of attributes that people mean when they say monogamy, and sometimes they mean some of those, sometimes they mean all of those. But if you define it strictly in terms of, uh, and, and at least the, the, the adjective that's often applied to try and differentiate this definition from, say, a social definition is effective monogamy, right? So it's, if it's effectively monogamous, then the definitional criteria are strictly in terms of variance. If there's no variance in reproductive success between males, and if there's no difference in the variance in reproductive success, that is a difference in difference um, uh, between the sexes, then they are by definition effectively monogamous. That is, the, the, that use of the term monogamous is linked only to the distributions. It's not linked to behavior at all. Why does that necessarily have to be true? What if you have high skew in females and high skew in males, and so there's no difference between the, in, the, in the degree of variance between males and females, but you've got high skew in both, so I don't think you necessarily wind up with monogamy in that case. Well, so again, keeping in mind that we're not talking about social behavior, right? I'm not we're talking, talking about social behavior. Right, right, right. So we're talking about the strength of the sexual selection pressure. So you won't expect, for example, sex differences with regard to armaments. Both sexes might be heavily armed, or most both sexes might be, you know, uh, free of armaments. Both sexes might be small, or both sexes won't, might be large. But there won't be a difference between them. If there's no difference in the variance in reproductive success, but they're both quite skewed. How, in so what way is that defining like monogamy? It. I can see defining monog effective monogamy as there's no extra pair of paternity, or it's all you know, the, the, all the all the reproduction happens within the pair. It's it's an but attempt. It's an attempt to provide a causal explanation on the origins of the force of sexual selection. That's what it is. It's not, not an attempt to explain social behavior. I, I think an important thing to interject is is that oftentimes we talk about the the strength of selection measuring uh, variance in reproductive success, and and what's really important to talk about evolutionary change is that yes that variance, but then how that variance affects particular traits, um, and and so <coughs> the. Certainly, the, these, these uh, tamarins have a, a lower degree of, of dimorphism um, than other species. Um, I've always wondered um, whether we're not looking at the right things, and a lot of times it's not often measured. So for example, there are um, s small but significant differences in body size in males and females. Um, and I think that's something that merits a little bit more, more research. And I think there's also important variance um, in, in, uh, <coughs> between breeding females and, and, uh, and non-breeding females in, in morphology. Um, or, or I think there's a potential for that. I'm, I, I don't have the data for it, but I wonder if, if we're losing something. But I think it's important to, 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 to link the variance in, in reproductive success. And when we talk about the intensity of sexual selection or whatever measure you use it, to link it to a particular trait. So, so I, I'm reading between the lines of what you just said just now, but do you think that there was a, that there's a subordinate morph in females, for example, and that when the dominant is removed, then they grow and become more aggressive? That would be awesome. <laughs> but I don't, I don't know that it's the case. Um, I, I, think, I think we haven't looked hard enough. But I think there is maybe potential for that. Sorry. 
But Brooke, is what you were, I'm just trying to conceptualize this, but isn't there actually more, I mean, we obviously, I think this is what you were trying to say, is there's more than one way to arrive at a mean, right? And if you've got a whole or bunch at, of females. Or at no difference. Or at no difference, exactly. And it's, got, it's not the mean, it's the variance. That I know, and I'm right. saying, you're talking about the difference between males and females, that if there's, about there being no difference. I'm saying there's, you can get that with high skew of both sexes, That's or correct. you can get it with low with skew of both sexes. That's correct. And in both cases, you wouldn't expect sexual dimorphism. But, okay, but Hannah Coco also says you can, you don't, the, the typical definition of male male competition is something that we see in terms of something like armaments and, and sexual dimorphism and things like that. But she thinks it's, compl it's also completely plausible that you could compete by caring. And correct, so, correct. The behavior is also important. Right. So, I mean, this. just because we don't see these physical differences doesn't right. mean. And it looked like there was a trend actually toward more skew when you looked at this over the. over time, right? You mean less skew for the males? Oh, there was less skew? Okay. Well, that, that's, that's my a priori are, expectation. Uh, yeah, because the males, the males are gaining more paternity. So, over time, it equals out. I don't know. We don't have the data. I think we need to look. Okay, but sorry, I think I think it's the it's the default expectation that you would have that that if you have all these males mating with a female, then it should it should be less. And my explanation for why we don't see it is is is, is that we don't have the the time scale that we have for the female data, for instance. Um, and yeah, I think I think sexual selection can also act on behavior. Um, so that's so that's that's another that's another issue in terms of. You know, there's the ornaments and armaments that we that we can see, um, sort of with the plain eye, but there's also the behavior and the reproductive suppression and stuff like that that we that we that we have to measure in other ways, and that can be affected too by by sexual you, selection. Uh, now, most primate group living females don't um, suppress one another. Mm -hmm. What's different about tamarins that allows one female to suppress the reproduction of another? Um, I can't say with certainty, but olfactory cues are very important for these primates. I don't know if that's different from other primates, and that explains why. Um, I'm not sure. If there's so a diverse receptor to re respond to that, why what? would they have that? Why would they be responding to a cue? How would it be in their fitness? Because there's, there's oh, a female mean. initiated infanticide. Right. Well, that sounds very much like armament to me and dimorphism because you have an adaptation for murder of an offspring in addition to the difference in male testicide, by the way, which is dimorphism as well. This isn't, these, these are things that we would never associate with uh, monogamy in my understanding before is a big difference in testicide and female or male infanticide of the young. These, these are markers of you know, poly and every other species I'm aware of. Well, it's a funny kind of a system, and the, the, the testes size difference that Sam alluded to is in, in many ways analogous to the reproductive suppression in that um, mm -hmm. the, you have a dominant individual who is morphologically different in some aspect from a subordinate individual, but you're not, you're not sure what the causal relationship between yeah. status and morphology is yeah. there. So yeah. again, you can have this subordinate yeah. morph, which is why invest a lot in testes if you're, uh, you're unlikely to actually get the paternity. So you wait, um, and maybe what they're doing is queuing to a certain extent. Yeah. Right? Um, you wait, and then when you're able to assume a dominant position, then your testes grow. And similarly, if you're a subordinate female, if the dominant female is infanticidal, um, you know, it's, you, you're, you're better off being, at the helper, being a helper at the nest than having offspring that get killed. And in and, and conversation, Sam mentioned to me something, a finding from another lab that I hadn't heard of before, that there, there's... Um, oh, yeah. uh, ultrasound evidence that there's a, an equivalent of a Bruce effect where um, uh, if subordinate females get pregnant, they don't carry the term because they're going to lose them anyway, right? Um, uh, so it's not the case that, that there is no competition. And you may be right, Ed, that these, these may be, we may just be looking at the wrong attributes, right? The canine size dimorphism might be, not be the right thing to look at here. But at the very least, it challenges conventional definitions that are not social in nature. Um, uh, of, um, uh, of different mating systems. Yeah, yeah. and that, that paper, by the way, is uh, out of uh, Karen Bales's uh, lab, and it's on golden lion hammerings. You know, I, th I thought they use ultrasound. I thought the, th the thing that really made classical sexual dimorphism and, and com uh, competition, intrasexual competition among males, particularly unique, was its riskiness. 
Right. Right. And so right. it can't really be the case that something like, oh, cooperation is just, you know, caring could be just seen, seen like interceptive cooperation just in the same way of having like big scary teeth or something like this. Unless you can argue plausibly that there's, it's, it's a risky venture. In the same way that trying to slash somebody's belly with your teeth is a risky venture. Correct. Well, it has opportunity. Cost. Well, carrying is a risky carrying venture is as well. Very risky. If it's you're going to make that argument, then yeah, that's fine, right? It's just, to me, it seems like a tough argument. To do. Why is carrying risky? Yeah, it's extremely risky because males lose about forty. My card, at least in taverns, they lose about forty percent of their body weight right. in the first uh, eight to ten weeks after infants are born. Forty percent. Forty percent. Yeah, Chuck Snowden touched on that. And so that, I mean, that's a really then, then those are things that need to be emphasized, right? Because you know, trying to slash somebody's belly with your canines right. and then having yours flash back is pretty good. I mean, yeah. the, the risks, right? The, the diminishing marginal utility <coughs> that you get, right, from 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 taking on those kinds of adventures. I mean, it's, the bottom could drop out, right? That's the neg the negativity bias, right? And I is a negativity bias for caring the same way as a negativity bias, right, for trying to stab fighting. somebody. Yeah, I mean, we don't. I don't. We don't have fantastic wild data on the same species um, on cotton tops as we. You know, obviously we've got amazing data from captivity, but yeah. you know that weight loss. And from what we do know, there's also a pretty significant increased predation pressure on males who are carrying because yeah. they're slow. There's, there's, they're slow. There's they decreased motility. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, there's evidence uh, out of um, Tony Ziegler's lab that males, male marmosets actually uh, gain weight in anticipation exactly. of, of the young coming. Um, but but I, w I was trying to figure out what, what your point was because I think, I think the, the idea, uh, I mean, I still th think your point is well taken. Out. Were you saying this was inconsistent? Because I, I view caring as risky, but I think not as risky as female reproductive competition. If that makes sense. But risk and cost are not the same thing. So you can say that you know right. that something's going to be expensive, and you can prepare for it by putting on weight, for example. Or right. Whatever. Exactly. You can right. also abandon it as opposed to a slash. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it, there are different definitions of risk, right. but um, uh, it seems to me that a, a core feature, at least as it pertains to either combat or scramble competition, is that there is the potential to incur high cost, but the that's a that that there's a, a large chance component to it, or at the very least, there's uncertainty as to the outcome. So if you know, if you're going to parent, you're going to lose 40% of your body weight, that's not risk. That's just investment. No, but I think the predation... But there's cost. Predation, it's, there's... It, it's kind of, uh, yeah, it's kind of like, uh, you know, do, if, if I can bet that there's no God, even if I have a low p probability, right, when I, <laughs> when, I, when I calculate the expected utility, that's going to bring right that my my assessment risk assessment down, right for that expected to be to be quite low even though the probability is really low because burning in hell is, is just way 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 right that's and so it's it's that's something actually that's really quite different than I mean I guess I'm just kind of parenting Dan's point quite different than I'm weighing my costs of of of, of perhaps um, you know getting too skinny or something. And, and there's some, there's certain things that I can do actually to mediate this, mitigate this risk, right? And with, with certain reason, well, or probability, I can do this. this kind of thing. For sure. Roberto, uh, so oh, oh, sure. A different question. Uh, <laughs> you have time. So your, your criticism of the theoretical literature, Trevers and others, uh, yeah. makes it sound a puzzle. The puzzling oh. that that um, that the behavior that you observe in some species is so rare, isn't? Doesn't it? I mean, what, um, I'm sorry, you, you made it sound as um, there isn't really a good reason why it's usually the males who are competitive and the females who. Um, I think, and, and, and largely, I'm I'm, uh, uh, I'm I'm talking about what what Coco and Denians um, um, mentioned in the in the article, and and I think what they're saying is that it's still a conundrum, and that. And isogamy and the operational sex ratio are sort of insufficient to to explain what we see. Is that? Is that it's ins insufficient to explain why, in general, to, we see to why in general we see that. Yeah, we we see a pattern of male competition. Sure. Right. right. Uh, so it is. Um, is this widely understood that that's a puzzle? Uh, I thought. 
Thought no, no, it's not. It's yeah. not, which is why they wrote the paper. Yeah, I mean, but 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 there is, but there is no that that has always been a con, it's basically been a conjecture. So when Trivers wrote, he wrote a paper. He didn't write a model. He didn't, you know. So so it's it's and and that's the point that they make in the paper that 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 you need to um, go from a verbal argument to 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 sort of use math to to test if these things work. And then look at the data and see if these things are consistent, rather than saying, "Well, I think it's this." And and so I think I think that's the point. And 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 Trivers did point out some of these factors that they point out as important later on. But it's just that it's sort of become widely accepted without a critical scientific basis necessarily. And and I, and I and 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 just. Taking a broader view, I sort of I sort of feel that way too about uh, Darwin and sexual selection. So Darwin used sort of language that was you know appropriate to his time, but a lot of the science is is is, is solid and and explains actually the deviations that we see um, from what the typical role is. But but if we're not critical and don't investigate those, we sort of don't distinguish between those two things between the science and the and the sort of stereotypical description of it, or the verbal description of it. So that's sort of the point that I was trying to make.